Now welcoming to the stage, Miss Understood. Where are you? And I'm so sorry. To be you to be yourself. Are you? Are you? Butt lovers. Welcome back to Camper Cringe, Lore's edgier cousin, where I watch young adult dramas and dramedies. So far on this series, we've covered MTV's Faking It, Awkward, Finding Carter, Happy Land, as well as the 2018 Heathers that Paramount made. But today we're covering Netflix's Insatiable, starring the queen of quirky faces herself, Debbie Ryan. This show was released from 2018 to 2019 and had two seasons and 22 episodes overall before it was promptly canceled. Critics and audiences seem fairly split on this decision according to Rotten Tomatoes, but the only review I really want to see if I agree with is my own. What? Before my channel got good, I released a glowing review of Insatiable while making slime? The first thing I did not like about the series. Also, apparently in the last six years, my balls dropped because why does my voice sound like that? But I don't think it's bad for the right reasons people are accusing it of being bad, if that makes sense. It doesn't. I wrote down a list of the things 2018 Athena disliked and liked about the series to see if I agree after my 2024 watch. But first, I think we need a breather. I need to take care of myself. Care of myself. Oh, I know how to with this video's sponsor. One of my biggest New Year's resolutions was for me to take on a better self-care routine. So I really appreciate Care Of for helping me start off the year right. Take it personally? Uh, okay, I will. First, I took their quiz and they were able to find vitamins for my specific personal needs. I mainly focused on stress, immunity, and skin. With how much makeup I do for this channel, skin was one of the most important things to focus on. Care of thinks of everything, from the compostable film of the pill packets to the inspirational quotes. You become what you believe. Thanks, Oprah. I take these vitamins every morning and it puts a pep in my step for the rest of the day. I also love this collagen powder. It perfectly blended into my morning coffee and didn't affect the flavor or aftertaste at all, which I love. Such an easy new part of my morning routine. They also gave me these immunity boosters and they are also incredible. They taste like sugar candy, but they're good for me. Sign me up. Use code Athena P for 50% off your first order at Care Of. Thank you so much to Care Of for sponsoring this video and for helping me take care of myself. I'll never stop saying that, sorry. Now back to the video. First things first, general content warning for eating disorders being a major part of this show. I don't get into very many details, but just figured I'd give you the heads up. And even though this video may not trigger you, I definitely wouldn't recommend this show for anybody recovering. Our two main characters are Patty Bladell and Bob Armstrong, and the very fucked up strange way their paths cross is the focus of this first episode. Patty was bullied her whole life for being fat. The first thing we see is the relentless bullying she faced on a day-to-day -day basis, which led her to a deep hatred of everyone in her school except for Nani, her best friend. Although if I were her, I'd hate Nani too. Let me tell you why. Patty has a crush on this guy named Brick because he helped her up after she fell. It's really quite sad. The only reason she has a crush on this guy is because he's not an asshole to her. He's the only one that's semi-decent to her. This origin story is such a painful watch. Like, the first episode might be my least favorite. So then, back to Nani. Nani blurts out to Brick that Patty wants to go on a date with him, despite the two barely knowing each other. Great call, Nani. That totally won't come across as too strong and scare him away. Oh, oh, there he goes. Patty, now very upset, is eating outside of a convenience store. Very Heather's coded. This man harasses Patty, tries to take her food, so she punches him, and then he punches her. Switching over to Bob's story, he's a lawyer, but he also loves coaching teen beauty pageants. Unfortunately for him, his client and her mother are huge pieces of shit. The first thing we hear this girl Dixie Sinclair say is something very casually transphobic, and she says slurs, and it made me cringe so much. The one thing I will say is that they're not supposed to be good or redeemable. They are supposed to be the worst people you've ever seen, and this show accomplishes that. It makes us empathize more with our main characters, who also aren't good people, but they're not as bad, so... This point is further driven into our skulls when Regina Sinclair, shitty girl's shitty mom, accused Bob of sexually assaulting her daughter, which never happened. The mom pulled that straight out of her ass just because Dixie didn't win the pageant. And while he didn't deserve to have his reputation tarnished, I will say this. Why would you choose to coach someone who you know is a bad person? Just to attempt to win a competition that feeds off the looks of children and the vanity of adults? Kind of walked into the knife there. And this is a constant theme with Bob. Get ready for Bob to just keep digging his own grave deeper and deeper. With his reputation destroyed, he takes on a case no one else wants. 
Patty's case. But he's never going to beat those allegations with how he ogles at how much weight Patty lost due to her liquid diet from having her jaw broken. We have slow-mo shots of Debbie Ryan now wearing clothes that are flattering as this fully grown man admires her. Very normal, super cool, I'm being sarcastic. He's supposed to be representing her in court, but all the while his internal monologue is scheming about how he's going to get back into the pageant industry. Why would you want to? I don't know. And because Patty is so not used to people being nice to her, she felt like she loved him. Just like she did with his son, Brick. Oh yeah, did I mention Bob is Brick's dad? Bob the Builder, naming his son, uh... Brick. Another essential piece of the story is that there's another Bob, Bob Barnard, who people call Hot Bob. He's also a lawyer, his daughter just won the last beauty pageant, so these Bobs hate each other. I mean, what are the odds two dudes named Bob have the same career and interests? Main character Bob, Bob Armstrong, and his wife Coralie are throwing a gala. Reputation and status are very important to his wife Coralie, so to get around these false accusations about her husband, she is schmoozing the other Bob and his wife at May. This all comes to a head at Bob Armstrong, main character Bob's gala, where he's raising money for cancer, but everyone's just shitting all over him and treating it like a joke, even his wife. It's just bleak, dude. I don't know. I wanted to skim over it, but Bob's wife, Coralie, is being such an asshole, acting like the only purpose of this event was securing her rightful place in society. One episode in, we haven't seen a single healthy human interaction. It's actually, it's actually kind of impressive if you think about it. Now we see Bob Armstrong not focusing on his fragile and unstable marriage, but instead the unstable emotions and fragile self-esteem of his teenage client. At his lowest, alone in his car, he takes off his toupee and starts smacking himself in the face with it. He's very theatrical. I don't understand half of what he does, but it's very funny. Oh, wait, maybe not funny. He's now contemplating taking a sewer slide straight to hell. Can't have that. He's one of the main characters. Meanwhile, Patty at her mother's AA meetings runs into the man from the beginning that punched her, and now since winning the case, she wants more revenge. At first, she wanted to sleep with him and then break his heart. Very elaborate plan. But after he passes out, she comes up with a better plan, lighting him on fire. But she backs out of it. Boo! And Patty thinks about Bob's proposal for her to be a beauty queen, and she agrees, which is what stops him from killing himself. Uh, 2018, Athena, I don't know why you continued watching this for funsies beyond this point, but let's continue. I think I knew that deep down they would commit to Debbie Ryan going on a killing spree, and that's just too fun not to watch. I'm Radio Rebel. Why do they call you Radio Rebel? Do you like... <laughs> play music that they banned at school or something? What? No, I play music and I kill people. Nothing more rebellious than that. I mean, I mean, you're not wrong. What the fuck? Is this allowed? So turns out the man that she wanted to light on fire was actually lit on fire, even though she backed out of it. We see her best friend, Nani, clearly in love with her. And Bob Armstrong is still fighting those allegations, but still wanting to do pageants, even though his wife said he probably shouldn't. And I'll give her this, she's right. He should listen to her, but he obviously doesn't because we have two seasons, so strap in. There is not a chance in shit you can predict all the twists and turns this show takes. We're running on the rails of a crazy train. Regina Sinclair, who accused Bob of being an endangerment to kids, is an endangerment to his kid to Bob's kid. She has a very inappropriate relationship with Brick. Best way to fly under the radar, I guess, is to accuse somebody else of committing a crime you're actually committing. This was something 2018 Athena pointed out that she hated. I was expecting her to not be used as sort of comedic relief, and I know that this show has more of a satirical style. It's not funny anymore after she a kid. And I couldn't agree more. This actually could have been a very interesting plot line if they weren't so explicit about it. Like we see a full Ew. scene with an adult character and an underage character and I, I was so uncomfortable. And they were also simultaneously undermining how illegal and disturbing this is. Normalizing this disgusting behavior is something almost all of the shows I've covered in Camp or Cringe do. And I'm sick of it. I'm so sick of it. Like, I get it. You're trying to be edgy, but like be edgier and have the kid like shoot her in the head or something. 
Bob Armstrong proved that the drunken douchebag actually lit himself on fire while trying to light a cigarette. Would this have happened if Patty didn't douse him with liquor? No, but who's to say that he wasn't covered in liquor? I hardly know her. Already. Drunken douchebag in the hospital says Patty should thank him for punching her in the face because that's how she... She lost weight. Uh, Patty told him to die, and then he did. Like, immediately after being told off, he dies. And episode two ends with a devilish Debbie Ryan smirk. I'm sorry to say it, but Debbie Ryan is carrying. There's something about Disney Channel acting, with the inclusion of murder and cursing, that really lifts my spirits through this shit show. Who says a shit show can't be fun? as stinky as it is. Episode three was nothing, but a whole lot of it. Bob Armstrong keeps having women and young girls after him, and he rejects them outright, saying that he loves his wife. Speaking of his wife, we see her backstory and motivation for appearing like the perfect rich housewife. What do you think? Not bad for trailer trash, huh? Don't you ever say that about yourself. This was supposed to be them in high school. It's the same actors playing them, but I think it's cute. I actually really liked seeing their origin story because it made me root for them a bit more, even though I knew they weren't gonna last. Bob and Patty also bonded over binge eating as she watched him devour crawfish, shell and all. And this made her fall even harder for him. I didn't remember this whole plot of Patty having a crush on Bob lasting this long. He already said no to her, which is when this relationship probably should have ended. But Patty's convinced he only rejected her because of his wife, so now she's determined to break them up. Episode 4, Brick's parents, Bob Armstrong and Coralie, find out that their son was taken advantage of by Regina. But because he said he wanted her as well, they don't really focus on his well-being or his trauma or the crime that just occurred, instead focusing their attention on the mother-daughter pageant coming up. Well, mother being role model, so Patty and Coralie compete together, and they form what appears to be a genuine bond. All the while, Patty's actual mother is making a mess of things by acting like her daughter's dreams are useless. But the real showstopper was Regina being arrested in front of everyone? I forgot that shit happened because she is in the rest of the series, unfortunately. But damn, I wish that consequence stuck. I get that it's a dark comedy, but there's plenty of fucked up things happening in the plot already. Why couldn't we just let that one rest? I guess you'll have to see in season two. So the silver lining is Regina being arrested, even though that's short lived, and Patty bonding with Cora Lee, right? Well. Patty and her mom actually made up, but when Patty wanted to hang out with her mother and Coralie, Coralie said that she was finally accepted by the rich bitches, so they can't hang out anymore. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Yikes. So Patty decides she is going to destroy Bob and Coralie's marriage after all, with the information she received from Stella Rose last episode. Oh, I should probably introduce you to who the fuck that is then, right? So this is Stella Rose. Stella Rose and Bob met at a pageant and had a brief affair while Bob was married to Coralie. Stella Rose gave this heart necklace to Patty to give to Coralie so that Coralie can discover this affair that happened about 20 years ago. Episode 5, Coralie decides to take a break as she reconsiders her relationship with Bob. Yay. Meanwhile, the other Bob, aka Bob Barnard, aka Hot Bob's daughter, Magnolia, has been exposed for doing drugs by this dude, Christian, who Patty kind of likes. Conveniently, during this episode where Nani is coming to terms with the fact that she's gay, Brick has a brief interaction with the LGBTQ club at school, which makes him best friends with all of them, and the most amazing ally there ever is. I cannot emphasize how little time we saw him with them before he called on them like the gay vengers here to save patty's charity fundraiser thing that she has to do for the pageant can you say shoehorned 2018 athena loved this plot point because it touched on patty's body dysmorphia in a way that humanized her and in the process she bonded with a trans woman going through something not the same at all but similar ish a little kind of here's a clip from how i explained it back then obviously those things are not the same thing and they're not saying it's the same thing it's just two people who are bonding over the fact that they are not completely comfortable in their own bodies yet for different reasons yes and i thought that was a really really great moment now here's a clip from the scene for Context. I thought once I had my surgery, I'd feel better about myself. I'm still not comfortable wearing a bathing suit. Sometimes I wonder if I'm going to spend the rest of my life waiting for it to start. Me too. Maybe we don't have to. I feel so 
Free? No, I was gonna say totally self-conscious. Oh, thank God, me too. Okay, baby step. So I get why I thought this was well done. Even now, I don't think it was bad, just very forced. We never see this character again, which just feel like her struggles were a way to spoon feed us sad Patty. Look, Patty is sad. Oh. Feel bad for her. Oh. Feel bad for her even oh. more. Also, she's not transphobic. Isn't that cool? Like this trans character is only here to make our cis main character seem more likable and human. I mean, that's nowhere near the worst thing the show has done. I don't even think it's bad. It's just... Nah, it's just a little lazy. Like the sentiment is there, they just should have fleshed it out more. Definitely don't think it's worthy of its own talking point for this show's strengths, straight Athena. <laughs> Rick kisses Patty, and Nani watches absolutely devastated as she realized, oh yeah, I am in love with Patty. And also after she had a conversation with this lesbian wearing this shirt that says vegetarian. Oh my god, faking it flashbacks. Vagitarians. Episode 6 is all about Patty getting baptized to enter the Miss Magic Jesus pageant, while she is also obsessing over losing her virginity to Brick. And look, I can confidently say that this episode is one of the best examples of camp I've ever seen. Could you do like a quickie baptism? You know, like a Dunkin' Go. I don't do Dunkin' Goes. The big boss wouldn't approve. The big boss? God, Bob. And you don't want to piss him off. Bob is now Patty's godfather, which is wild. Their relationship started from him being her lawyer, him noticing, oh, she's pretty. She could be my new pageant queen. And now he's her godfather. There's just so many layers to this. Why are these two so intertwined in each other's lives? They're both walking red flags in the most slay way. Episode six, we're introduced to Dee and the fact that she's not one of the main characters is a crime. She does have a multi-episode journey. She's confident. She ends enters beauty pageants, even though most people put her down, and introduces all our current main characters to the concept of being a good person. I know, I know. It all started with Dixie Sinclair acting like an asshole as usual, and Dee responded with, I couldn't give any less of a fuck what you think about me. And then she overheard Magnolia telling off Patty for lying. Magnolia and Patty were briefly friends in episode five, so Magnolia expected better when Patty kissed her ex right in front of her, and then when she was confronted about it, she lied. Is Brick seeing someone else? Uh, no. No, no way. I'm sure you're just being paranoid. I saw you kiss him at the dog wash. She's also a terrible liar. I mean, come on. But while Magnolia was telling her off for an actual valid reason, catching someone in a lie is a real, wow, you think I'm stupid moment. Anyway, Magnolia could have walked away from the situation with the moral high ground, but instead she makes a remark about Patty's body. Dee overheard all of this and was like, what the fuck was that about? And then we have this exchange. I lost 70 pounds, so now it's my turn to get the guy. Being skinny don't mean shit if you're ugly on the inside. D is a legend. I'm pretty sure D thought her and Patty were going to bond over assholes constantly making remarks about the way they look. But instead, Patty was like, I can get the man now that I'm skinny. And D is like, wow, you literally hate yourself so much you're only thinking skin deep. Damn, that's a shame. Couldn't be me. I love D. How the fuck? I'm sorry. How the fuck? Fuck, did 2018 Athena point out the bikini body dysmorphia scene and not this and not even mention D? I'm so concerned for younger me. I don't know what priority she had and no wonder this video is unlisted. Dear Lord. Patty, who's dating Brick, is trying to set up Christian with Magnolia. He's already Magnolia's drug dealer, so this is a tale as old as time. What a fun meet cute. But because Magnolia wants to get back with Brick, Magnolia and Christian's original agreement is to pretend to go out to make Patty and Brick jealous. Also, Patty still has a crush on Christian. Awesome way to overcomplicate a plot I really don't give a shit about. High school romances? Uh, snooze, snooze, I'm asleep, I'm snoring. <sighs> when are Bob and his wife gonna get back together? And more importantly, when are the Bobs gonna get together? Yeah, spoiler alert, I've been holding it in this entire time. But Bob's bisexuality arc is my favorite thing ever. It's so over the top and fun and filled with drama. Oh shit, I think it actually started with this episode because the Bobs are wrestling for some reason. What? Why are they wrestling? Bob Armstrong, man character Bob, you came to the school to talk to the wrestling coach to learn about your son's life and be supportive over what he does. Not to kiss your son's ex's dad, AKA your childhood friend turned enemy turned lover. This is normal for Bob. Bob has a weird sense of boundaries. Like when he caught Brick and Patty before they were gonna do things, he forbids his son from 
sleeping with someone on the grounds of she needs to do good in this pageant so don't distract her. That was a wild way to write him. There was one line thrown in there that mentions Bob's fear of Patty's violence and expresses concern for his son. That is actually a great concern. I just wish it was his main one. He really does care more about Patty doing well in the pageant than his son having a healthy relationship with her. He could have been written as at least a good dad, but this dude is a walking disaster. Him and Patty are the same. They've been saying that this whole time and it's been really creepy, but they're right though. They both deal with constant abuse, but then use that to be terrible. Nani starts developing feelings for Dee after she sees Dee sing in this coffee shop. And I love that for them, but this line was kind of weird to me. If any of you are interested in seeing a beauty pageant contestant who eats something besides celery and rice cakes... Most beauty pageant contestants have eating disorders, and I don't, so I'm better than them. What? Why are we clapping? D, I'm sorry. You lost me with that one. Bad writing. It's just bad writing. Her first appearance was awesome, and I love that she's gonna date Nani. Don't ruin this. Patty and Brick have been boyfriend-girlfriend for about a day, and she already cheated on him with Christian, Bruh. who she tried to set up with Magnolia. Nani and Patty have an I love you and I love you too, just not like that faking it moment, but instead of Nani being heartbroken, she's just fully pissed. Not because her crush was one-sided, but more so because their entire friendship was one-sided. Also, Bob trying to be supportive of his son ruins the whole wrestling match by distracting him from the sidelines with his weird yells of encouragement. So now Patty and Bob are fully relying on a higher power to get rid of all their glaring character flaws, self-esteem issues, terrible decision-making, and mental illness. This baptism will make them reborn. Yeah. That's totally how that works. Oh, and Magnolia spiked Patty's drink with Molly. Have I mentioned that all these characters are horrible people? And I hate to admit it, but it's a really fun watch. Because even though I watched this whole series already, so much happens every episode. I completely forgot about this. Have you ever wanted a high, drug-induced, trippy scene of Debbie Ryan swimming deep into a baptism tank, talking to a donut about the unfillable hole in her soul? And then that scene ends with her in a bikini breaking up with her boyfriend of a day, only to get <coughs> by another dude on the church playground. None of those words are in the Bible, besides maybe baptism and church. Everything else I'm gonna say no. Episode 7, Magnolia's confidence is down the shitter after losing two boyfriends to Patty in two days. We thought Stella Rose just helped Roxy with pageants, but turns out Roxy is her daughter, which means Bob Armstrong might be her dad. Patty was first runner-up in Miss Magic Jesus, and Magnolia won. Also, Roxy is Bob's daughter. Not main character Bob, not Bob Armstrong, Bob Barnard. Bob bastard child having Barnard. They also both had sex with Stella Rose, what do these two not have in common? Bob Barnard begs for Bob Armstrong's silence and the fact that he has the secret kid, so he admits that Magnolia cheated in the pageant because she had the answers to the Jesus quiz. He's doing this to make sure that Magnolia doesn't find out about his secret kid, but riddle me this, how does he not notice her standing right there? Bob blind as fuck Barnard. So, uh, yeah, she knows. She didn't handle this news well and she's in rehab now. Like I said, a lot happens every single episode. Patty runs away with Christian just because Bob doesn't pay attention to her for this one episode. I guess her daddy issues fully possessed her. And you already know what I'm gonna say. Relatable. Next episode, she returns home because after she had sex with Christian, she said, I love you. And he said that was fine. And she was like, oh, I thought I fled my home and my friends and everyone I love. I thought I left that all behind me for love, not for fun. Fuck you. I'm Miss Magic Jesus. Bob and Coralie made up and were briefly together again, but then it was revealed that while she was on her little break, she slept with their masseuse, and he's all bitter about it. Patty thought she was pregnant for the entirety of episode 8, but turns out she just ate her twin in the womb, the pastor's convinced that this absorbed twin is pure evil that needs to be extinguished. In this universe, this dude actually does have this weird sixth sense where he puts his hands on someone and reveals all their desires, whatever they're thinking, if they're feeling guilty about something. Bob Barnard took over Bob Armstrong's dad's company. Now they're having a fist fight, which led to uh, they stopped being friends because Bob Barnard was in love with Bob Armstrong and didn't want to admit it. You guys need to understand what a mindfuck this is for Bob Armstrong. Whoa, wait. 
I hated you. Now you're confessing that you loved me? But I love my wife. But I like kissing you. Uh, ow! <laughs> ow, my brain! What the fuck is happening? While my favorite part of the show played out, Patty and Dixie are having a fight on top of this wiener dog truck because Patty had a wiener dog sponsorship for the pageant. I don't even know where to start with that. This fight was also wild and ended with Dixie veneer vampire biting Patty in the neck and then Patty, out of self-defense, pushed her off of the truck. Episode 9 starts with this horrifying dream that Patty's having where Dixie died. And Patty was talking to her demon twin <laughs> parasite. I thought I've consumed so much media throughout the years that nothing could surprise me. Nothing could have prepared me for that. And then that leading into a dramatic yell into the camera. This character and this entire show was meant for Debbie Ryan. I want more dark comedies that are so camp they swing back around to Disney Channel acting. This is like if Disney Channel was written by Family Guy. Because even if you hate Family Guy, even if you hate the Disney Channel, the combination of these energies is so fucking cuckoo bananas, you keep watching out of pure curiosity, fear, and dare I say it, entertainment. I'm entertained due to the sheer stupidity, and I don't mind that. Bob is convinced he's not bi due to his internalized biphobia and the fear of him completely uprooting his life with this realization. We don't even, let's have makeup sex because I am a heterosexual man with heterosexual man needs. I love this character. He's a disaster. He may have been the blueprint for Feralton. Can you believe I brought back that character in the year 2024? After Patty uses a Ouija board to talk to her demon, Christian, who's giving massive JD vibes, explains that it's actually super sexy that she has this demon. He didn't say I love you after sex, but he did say I love you after he realized that there's a demon in her. He, he really likes this about Patty. Christian's the pastor's son, by the way. Dixie is alive but wheelchair bound. And when everyone begins to take her side, Patty is like, this is bullshit. She's for sure faking. She's a terrible person. Bad things don't happen to bad people. See? And in front of everyone at this anti-bullying assembly, she throws Dixie onto the ground. Yeah, that wasn't the move. This episode ended with the Bobs taking things further. Bobbing around on their Bob's furniture, I don't know. Episode 10 explores Patty's mom's trauma. Patty's mom was taken advantage of by her stepdad at 14 years old. And now he's back trying to be with her, trying to convince her that they were in love when she was a child. He was about to prey on Patty too, but then Patty's mom swoops in, pretends to be interested, and asks if he still had drugs for them to do in the car. To which she said yes. I'm gonna freshen up, she says. I'll meet you there. He sits in the car like a fucking dumbass as she calls the cops for him to get arrested. That was pretty badass, I must say. Anyway, in the middle of Patty's birthday party, Patty's mom told her, I'm gonna leave for a bit, see you later, and she stole her shitty arrested stepdad's car. As cool as that is, why are you leaving your daughter on her birthday? Patty and her mom just started seeing eye to eye, and then her mom just runs away, right before Patty's roast. Patty is not stable enough to be roasted. This was probably one of Bob's worst plans yet. While Nani was roasting Patty, she once again realized that the friendship is one-sided. And she said, happy birthday, bestie. I don't want to be friends with you anymore. Terrible timing on all of these people. Her mom stops being her mom. Her best friend stops being her friend. And then Patty walks in on the Bob's kissing. 2018 Athena actually talked about this. Patty's mom had so much character development and then she left at literally the worst time, her daughter's birthday. And I understand that this was to back up Patty's kind of freak out at Bob later, but I don't think any person thinks like that. Oh yeah, my mom left, that's fine. But Bob is bisexual and cheating on his wife, like, and yeah, listen, it was absolutely irrational that she took that personally. But this is Patty we're talking about. She outs Bob to everyone, including his son, Brick. <laughs> How many times can Patty destroy Brick's life in the process? I'm just gonna say it. Poor Brick. Dude can't catch a fucking break. Turns out Dixie was faking her injury, so Patty was right about that. But that was completely overshadowed by Patty's rage and Bob's affair. Bob told Patty to stay away from him because she's ugly on the inside. This is the worst insult to Patty. Not enough for her to fix it, but that doesn't stop her from having her cake and eating it too. That's how the saying goes, right? It's just about, just about people eating cake. We get this lovely ASMR for the rest of the credits. Ooh, this is satisfying. Emphasis on sad. 
Fine. Episode 11 has a really strange set of circumstances that lead to Brick and Patty working out together. Christian has also been very threatening these past few episodes, so when she sees his car where her and Brick are training, she lets Brick know, and Brick warns Christian to stay the heck away from them, or else. This sends Debbie Ryan all the way to Smirk City. <laughs> Brick strong. <laughs> Me likey. Roxy is now connecting with her dad, Bob Barnard, and both Bobs agree to coach her. Patty tries to apologize to Bob Armstrong, but it doesn't go over well. And he even rubs the fact that he's coaching Roxy in her face. This is the saddest we've seen her all season. She really went zero to a hundred over this whole pageant bullshit. She is convinced that getting the crown is the only way that she'll ever be happy. At first she thought being skinny would make her happy. She's still not happy. She's convinced winning will make her happy. She will do anything besides the internal work she actually has to do. Ready for bisexual bullshit? The Bobs and Coralie are all crying. Bob Armstrong loves them both. They're all distraught. And then Coralie sees the Bobs kiss and she's like, and then she makes out with Bob Barnard, and Bob Armstrong's like, Oh, all right, I can work with this. Possible thruple couple, everybody. Patty, after spiraling about Roxy taking her place, Bob is supposed to be my pageant coach slash father figure. Patty tases Roxy with a taser, but then someone takes out Patty with a blow dart. And that's where the episode ends. Season one finale time. Stella Rose and Roxy kidnap Patty. Dun dun dun. Roxy wasn't there to reunite with her dad. She wanted revenge. This cutthroat plot revolving around beauty pageants is perfect, by the way. I feel like I've said that already, but still. And then Brick walks in on this. Poor Brick. But Bob's not concerned about his son or anything. He wants to keep the party going. But his wife and boyfriend are like, ah, maybe tomorrow, the mood is gone. And Bob's like, oh yeah, well if the mood is gone, why am I still horny? I'm gonna say it. This guy's a legend. Stella Rose revealed her evil scheme to Bob. <laughs> You'll never win regionals now because Roxy is with me. And Bob responds with, no, wait, 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 I, I don't care. I just had sex with my wife and boyfriend. My life is great. If Bob took his own life in episode one, he never would have had that three way. Now that's inspirational. Think about that next time you're down. Stella Rose, devastated about how well Bob's life is going, decides she's gonna kill Patty. But Patty escapes. Stella Rose is a terrible villain because if she was just a little patient, she would have seen the thruple break up before they even began. Bob's wife and boyfriend are now asking him to choose and he hates it. He wants both. Por que no los dos? And then they both just start beating him up. After Patty escapes from Stella Rose, she gets a text from Magnolia and decides she's gonna meet up with her. I think she feels bad about the whole stealing both of her boyfriends thing. But when she shows up, surprise, it's actually Christian, and Magnolia is knocked out in the trunk of his car. He thinks this will make Patty fall in love with him again because he got rid of the competition, and I was half expecting Patty to say, you imbecile, she's not my biggest competition. That's Roxy. Come back to me when you kidnap the right person. What? But Christian was like, I was thinking we could kill her together. And then he bites his lip just like Debbie Ryan. Oh, he's so excited. Magnolia wakes up and Patty saves her by bonking Christian on the head with a crowbar. Christian monologues about how this doesn't make Patty the hero and that she'll always be bad. Patty responds rationally by bashing him over the head repeatedly, shouting, I'm a good person! I'm a good person! It was pretty fun, I liked it. Bob is thinking about not being alive again because he can't have his puss and eat dick too. But Patty called him on the phone, so she saved him again. He has a weird definition of the word save. She didn't save you, bro. She just called you up so you can hide a body with her. And then Patty said she also killed Stella Rose, which we didn't see happen, so that was mind-boggling. I'm very confused. What the fuck? What the fuck? 2018 Athena had no thoughts on season two because my video reviewing the show came out before season two was released. So I guess we got through all of that. Dude, that old video was so surface level. I don't do that shit anymore. So we see the reveal of Stella Rose dying from Patty running over her twice. All of these kills sound like self-defense. I'm on Patty's side. Also, Stella Rose didn't actually die. We'll get to that later. She wanted to turn herself in, but Bob's like, no, we're in this together. We're in it for the long haul now and I'm most certainly an accomplice at this point. Oh Bob, how deep are you gonna dig this grave? Brick is now friends with Nani and Dee. 
This is new. It also goes nowhere. And Brick is still in love with Patty. Why? What has she done besides hurt him? Bob Armstrong managed to fuck things up even worse with both of his exes. He didn't realize Coralie was there to hear him choose Bob. And Bob doesn't want to see him either. He has bigger things to worry about since his daughter Magnolia went missing. This is probably the most in detail I'm going to get with the disordered eating behavior. So timestamp on screen if you want to skip this part. We see how bad Patty's relationship is with food. As she threw leftover cookies in the trash and doused them in soap to get Bob off her back, she pushed him out of the room and then proceeded to eat the cookies out of the trash with the soap all over them. Patty was the runner-up of the pageant and Roxy won. Patty is feeling so down on herself and sick that she throws up and cries. She thought that this victory would fix everything, so now that she doesn't have that to distract her, she is just breaking down over how traumatic season one was. Somebody killed Roxy. What? We heard her scream as Bob and Patty were having a moment, so it couldn't have been them. Also, whoever did this shoved roses down her throat. Okay, so who are our suspects? Maybe Christian? Oh no, we saw his body getting eaten by pigs. Uh, Magnolia? No, we saw her stumble in seconds before the scream, and she was out of it. She may have lost her memory. Dude, I don't remember. I watched this show and I'm fully lost here. Episode two clarifies that this redheaded girl with 10 names screamed and she was the one that found her. Unless that's a lie and she did it. I'm so confused. I thought the scream was Roxy. Apparently she was strangled with her sash first and those roses were just for presentation. Wow, this person isn't just a villain. They're a super villain. The pageantry board decided no one would win and no scholarships would be given out due to this tragedy. But Bob fires back like the lawyer that he is that this decision is admitting that the pageant board thinks that one of their girls did it. And the pageant girls would never. They're good godly girls who have strong friendships with each other, actually. Not the non-stop hatred and animosity we've witnessed firsthand. So how are they going to convince the pageant board of this? By throwing a funeral for Roxy, of course. All the girls only bond over their hatred of Roxy. So they decide to make the funeral a subtle fuck you to her, wearing yellow, her least favorite color, and by honoring her with a song when she hates music. Also, the song was Debbie Ryan rapping about how dead she is. You're still alive with roses Since you a dead girl You make me so sad You like was so rad but now it's over Dead girl actually killed me. I'm gonna be so real, this shit is funny. Oh, and also it worked. The funeral somehow went viral over being so moving. So Patty is back to being the winner. This episode ends with Dixie appearing for the first time in forever, only to immediately get run over. Now Dixie really can't move her legs, and she feels like it's karma for her lying about being injured the first time. And then she thought, Damn, I kind of have the worst role model in the world. And she's right, her mom encouraged her shittiness. She taught her that shittiness. Yeah, you know what? Fuck off, Regina, so your daughter has the slimmest chance, the tiniest chance in hell of being a good person. Now, for whatever reason, Coralie is bonding with Regina. Wh why? Why, though? Coralie, did you forget that this is the same old ass woman that took advantage of your underage son? Patty is in the hospital seeing if Dixie's okay, but... Why would she do that? Patty hates Dixit. Her whole pretending to care thing isn't convincing. But anyway, Patty sneaks into a hospital room, eats the donuts that were there, and then when she hears somebody come in, she hides and overhears that those donuts were actually for... Pause. Um, I'm just letting you know this is like the worst thing. I, I literally cringe so hard. She ate donuts that were there for a child cancer patient. Now, even Patty that's able to spin any story in her favor is like, wow, that's, that's bad. So this is the final straw. Patty goes to group therapy for people with eating disorders. There she learns that her relationship with food and her body is a result of what's going on mentally. People tell her it's not that the food is bad. It's not that the weight is bad. It is you using the food as a vice for whatever you're suffering with in here. It's very interesting that mental illness is a comfort to her because for so long she just thought she was a demon. They also recast Patty's mom's predatory stepdad and it was so jarring. Like did they think we wouldn't notice? For the longest time I was just trying to figure out who this fool was. 
But then he said his car was stolen by Patty's mom, and I wheezed. This is a totally different dude. But Gordy 2.0 reveals that he's Patty's father. What a crazy first appearance for this character. No, Athena, we've met him before, remember? It's just a different actor. I don't... I don't understand. Patty calls Dee for advice because Dee is Patty's sponsor even though she really doesn't want to be, what with their relationship being absolute shit. It's unfortunate that they use her character as the voice of reason when she's just being shut down from every angle. Patty is frantically explaining that she's cured because she met her dad. And Dee tries to explain that mental illness is like a lifelong journey. It's not cured in a day. But Patty hears none of it and hangs up. You're not listening. Annoying. It really is. Once Patty learns the truth about what a slime ball this guy is, she's rightfully furious. He is literally the root of her family's trauma. So when Patty accidentally backed him off a cliff, I wasn't supposed to cheer? I don't care. Fuck that bitch. But I will say another murder tied to Patty doesn't look good. Patty is so afraid that she's accidentally gonna kill people forever because she has her dad's evil genes. Lil Nas X said it best. Babies don't, don't gain, gain personality through genetics. We see her fear visualize with her imaginary dad. And honestly, the casting still isn't doing it for me. The first guy actually brought the horror and played up the seriousness, but season two wants more silly Jim Carrey vibes from the mother's abuser. It adds nothing. Wow, Dixie and Regina made up. Who cares? Patty's mom returns because she said the reason she fled was to get away from Gordy because he's a dangerous guy. But you just leave your daughter there? You didn't bring your daughter on the run with you? She has no idea that Patty met Gordy and that he's haunting her subconscious. She has no idea because she left. She didn't stay to protect her daughter or anything. But her mom did one thing right. Patty now knows that the dead guy might not be her dad. He's just a possible dad. So naturally, she's at the morgue to sample his DNA. That's uh probably the most suspicious thing you can do while a cop is tracking you down, but whatever. Bob Armstrong sees Bob Barnard and Coralie's close friendship, and he's pissed. He gives the pettiest speech where he announces that he's running for mayor against Bob Barnard. I don't really understand what Bob Armstrong's end goal is here. I don't even think he wants to be mayor. Oh, by the way, Gordy's not Patty's dad, so the entire plot of him dying and, and coming back was completely useless. Episode 5, titled Finding Magnolia, is all about Magnolia trying to regain her short-term memory. She finds an Instagram photo of her at Hughes University where she doesn't remember going, so her and Nani visit the campus to see if they can put the pieces back together. But Patty, as one of those pieces, is going with them to try and throw them off the trail. Equally as important, Brick is practicing kissing with YouTube tutorials and making out with fruit. Painful to watch, but also very real. What, you didn't do that? Yeah, me neither. Anyway, the whole reason Brick was practicing is because his ex slash new best friend Magnolia confided in him that he's not a good kisser. <laughs> Ouch. I forgot to mention that Patty and Brick are going to the dance together, so they're kind of back together. I forgot to mention that. I kind of, I kind of got lost in the sauce. You know, if the sauce was code for murder. I don't give a fuck about these romances. Wouldn't it be crazy if he told her he was watching those tutorials and she playfully teased him, leading to him kissing her to prove that he's improved? And then Patty saw that? Bro, run. Also, even more wild than that somehow, Regina always said that she adopted Dixie from China. Dixie is not adopted. Regina kidnapped her. Okay, finding Carter. And Dixie's also Korean. Can someone fucking kill Regina? She's so evil. I keep thinking she can't get worse, and she does, and she's a recurring character. Episode 6, Patty and Brick break up. Oh. No shit. Brick gets back together with Magnolia. Oh. No shit. And now Patty's dating Henry. No oh. shit. Wait, who's Henry? Dixie's biological brother that Dixie repeatedly hits on. She keeps hitting on her brother. Oh my gosh, this is just all the other shows I've watched combined into one. We have the bisexuality of faking it, the way too many characters of Awkward, the kidnapping of Finding Carter, the being in love with your brother of Happy Land, and the murder of Heathers. This show is the infinity gauntlet of shitty television. I can't believe they fit all of this into two seasons. What would they have done in the third? The dialogue is also so on the nose, I love it. No room for interpretation here. Patty said that Henry, this guy she's known for a little less than a month, is her cure. Girly Poop is allergic to therapy. She just keeps switching vices and never reflects. Which is wild, because you'd think with how much voiceover of her inner monologue we hear, that we would have reached a breakthrough by now. Also, it's worth mentioning that she views everything as a competition. So when she first met Henry, she was not hung up on Brick at all, because she's like, ooh, I can get a hotter, 
boyfriend. She never had an emotional connection to Brick because she didn't allow herself to because she viewed it as a way to make herself feel better, not that he's his own person with emotions. As he was trying to explain how he wasn't feeling heard in the relationship, his voice fades out and we hear her inner monologue, so she's not listening to him. Episode 7 follows Nani and we hear Nani's voiceover just like we did with Magnolia in Magnolia's episode. They're trying to show us the hopes and dreams of each character, but when we only follow them for one episode, it kind of loses all impact. Like, the last episode with Magnolia, she was talking about how out of place she felt. But this is the first and last time we hear about it. Like, maybe if you want to touch on these things, we should give it the attention it deserves. So Nani has some big character moments in this episode, as I said, but because they're not related to the main plot, cliff notes time. Patty was about to get attacked, but Nani sees this and defends her friend with an adult toy. Oh, like Legos? Well, that is certainly a toy adults can enjoy. That's not really what I was saying. So, like, Pokemon cards. Yeah, sure, whatever. We have the classic trope of, how did we get here? Rewind. Ah, it's rewind time. Nani and Dee broke up for some bullshit reason, and now we're all caught up. Oh, that was quick. Nani found the car of the dude that tried to kill Patty, and found a duffel bag full of money and a picture of Patty. So she realized he was a hitman someone called. That someone is that pageant girl with like 10 different names. Heather Christina Pamela Kendall Jackson Johnson was second runner up during that pageant where Roxy was killed. So she definitely has a motive. How did this pageant go? Patty ran away humiliated. She didn't even hear that she got third runner up for being so brave after she was almost killed. Oh, so a pity prize. <laughs> Patty would have loved that. Oh, and Patty's mom was jumped, tied up in her own house because her boob job was apparently full of cocaine. Um, <coughs> what? what? Patty saved her mom and killed three more people. I've killed three people. Things are getting pretty off the rails. What happens next? Another triple homicide? At the parade, Patty witnesses Heather Kendall Jeb blow up as well as the other two runner-ups. Everyone thinks Patty did it, and can you blame them? What's the kill count up to now? Christian, Gordy 2.0, three drug guys. And we still don't know if she killed Stella Rose. So at least five people so far. But five people who deserved it, so it's a 50-50 shot she won't go full murderer. Not bad odds. But I mean, not good odds either. Patty is the main suspect of the pageant girl's murders, AKA the triple homicide she didn't commit. They also made this joke in the show. It made me chuckle. And Bob got another lawyer for Patty because he came to the conclusion that their mentor-mentee relationship is not good for either of them. Bob, for once, great decision, but terrible timing. I know I've said this 10 times already, but Patty's not gonna like this. Bob Barnard's new boyfriend, this cop guy, is way more important than I thought he'd be. Before he got with Barnard, he fucked Bob Armstrong, and he secretly wants both of them. So naturally, he is very threatened by Coralie. She lived his dream of being with both Bobs at the same time. Which, side note, also got her pregnant. So great. These three who don't have a good relationship with any of their children are about to have another one. Where was I? Oh yeah, so Coralie got kidnapped by that crazy cop. When she tries to escape, she runs into Stella Rose. So she's alive. She was also abducted and brought here. Cora Lee escapes and Stella Rose stays to torture and kill her abductor. Bob Armstrong saved Cora Lee with the power of titty cocaine and then he started making out with Patty's mom. So Bob Armstrong is Patty's dad. He's a dad that stepped up. I have a feeling Patty's not gonna like this. Okay, series finale time. Stella Rose tried to kill Patty again, lost again. <laughs> I can't believe she thought she'd win. Stella Rose is now successfully killed by Patty, bringing Patty's kill count up to six. She's killing it. <laughs> Slay, queen. <laughs> it's been about a week and she still didn't get rid of Stella Rose's body. Instead, her priority was losing weight in time for the pageant. She's still doing the whole pageant thing. It's hilarious. Okay, so are you ready to know who the real pageant killer is? It was Regina. Yeah, yeah. They were playing her up as the big villain because she is the big villain. She successfully pinned all of these murders on Bob Armstrong. So now Bob Armstrong is in jail. But on the bright side, Patty won the pageant. Yay, happy ending. Her life is fixed now. Patty visits Bob in jail and tells him her plan to track down Regina, get a confession out of her, and then in her own words, take her out. Hey, she doesn't deserve to be dined after what she did. No dude, take out like killed. Oh, that's great. But Bob disagrees with this. Why? Oh, because he's scared. He realizes that Patty loves killing. We then see all of Patty's kills 
and it's revealed that she was smiling. We never saw this smiling as it was playing out, but now it's it's revealed to us that Patty actually really does like killing. I almost forgot how great this ending was. Patty says, and I quote, nothing tastes as good as killing feels. What a hard line for Debbie Ryan. Give Debbie her Emmy. So Patty is pretty much like Dexter, which is also funny because they mentioned that back in season one, like she wrapped herself, or maybe it was the premiere of season two. Anyway, she wrapped herself in plastic wrap and said she watches a lot of Dexter and Bob was like, that makes sense. But she literally is Dexter. She's only killing people that deserve it. Am I not supposed to be on her side? She's like, oh, I'm gonna stop hurting myself. I'm gonna hurt people that deserve it. Queen pageant queen. The final shot of the show is Bob repeatedly screaming Patty's name as he internally monologues about how he has to stop her. I'm so pissed there's no season three. Regina is still alive and I want to see her get killed. I need Debbie Ryan to kill more people. They were a bit overly ambitious with how many plot lines they were trying to do in such a short amount of time, but when you boil it down to just the main plot, of a vengeful beauty pageant winner who has always had an insatiable hunger, who's finally full of murder. It's pure camp. My verdict is camp. Do I like every joke? No, but the ones that hit, hit hard. And the story was so ridiculous it had me hooked. I actually really want a third season. Like I said, it's camp. That's my final rating. Netflix perfectly describes it as offbeat, and absurd. I don't know about witty, but bottom line, it's not for everyone. I feel like a lot of people are gonna be surprised that I like this. Hell, I'm surprised I like this. Some parts really made me feel like shit if I'm gonna be honest, but then I laughed so hard I forgave them. Once again, this is not an endorsement. Please take care of yourself. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Camp or Cringe Butt Lovers. Next Sunday, yeah, I'm calling it. I already know I'm gonna be late. I'm not gonna make that Saturday upload, is Trolls Lore. It'll be a great one. Subscribe if you want, like the video if you want, and have a great day. That's not optional. You have to. Bye!